<laughs> and uh, um, <laughs> so, and, it, it, and I said, oh, yeah, and it won a Smarty Award. I said, it's very, very good. Um, so, so, and I, I, so I, did, and I, I read the second one as well. And I remember going to a party at someone's house, um, and it was, it was like the third day of reading, reading a, a novel. Takes about if you do it slowly and easily and without too much, you know, hurry and enjoying yourself and, you know, giving yourself time to get it right. I would say three days, t ten to five with an hour for lunch and good tea break and a good coffee break, you know, is, is, you, can, you, can, you can get it done and in a way that is not too straining on your voice and you can keep refreshing it and, and it being interesting. So it was the end of the third day and I wasn't husky exactly, was just a bit, a tiny bit <clears throat> like that. And someone said, what have you been doing? And I said, I've been reading this children's story. It's the second one, actually. I said the first one was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, and this one is called Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. And one person at the party said, oh, yes, I've heard of these. They're really, I think they're quite popular. And I said, yeah, yeah. I, I said, I'm in the beginning to be. Um, there was an article, someone said, in a paper about these new children's stories about this. Is he a wizard or something? I said, yeah. And, oh, and like her parents read it to their children and then sit on the stairs reading the rest of it to themselves. And I said, yes, because they are quite Moorish, I said, they are fun. So, and, and so it slowly, like, and then when I'd done the third one, I said, oh, the Harry Potter, oh, yes. But the really amazing thing was when I was doing the fourth one, Jo Rowling herself had done a tour of America, uh, a signing tour, and, and that's, she'd just taken off there. And, they, and by this time, these were the most famous children's stories of their time, and they were about to become, perhaps, you know, she was the, the greatest literary phenomenon of, 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 of our age. And she told me about, you know, signing cues, you know, the, we've talked about the, the, the photography, but there's also the, um, you know, that people have presents for you, and they're very sweet. Anyway, she was in a shop in, a, in, in, in New York on the first one, and it was a massive line of people. And there were, you know, like 700 boys with scars on their foreheads, you know, and little goggle spectacles. And there was even a woman with a gilt frame around her, a fat woman. You know, like but, um, I mean, it's just, you get really bizarre things of that nature. But every now and again, someone in the queue would say, oh, Miss Rowling, as they would say her name wrong, usually. Um, Miss Rowling, I have this for you. And they would hand over a little envelope. And... And the, and the person from Scholastic, her publishers in America, or from her agents, uh, would grab the envelope and say, thank you, and snatch it away, and Joe would go, oh, thank you, oh, um, yes, and sign. And this kept happening, and eventually, after hours and hours of signing, the last book was signed, and she was rubbing the callus on her finger, and she turned and she said, by the way, you were very rude to those people who had things to give me. You just snatched them away like that. It was a bit odd, I thought. It was a bit offensive. And they said, oh, no, no, Joe, Joe. Um, these people have written their own scenarios in which Hermione does this or Ron does that, this happens to Dumbledore, and they've written little plot lines, whatever, and so when your next book comes out, there will be some similarity and crossover, and they will attempt to sue you. But they will not be able to sue you because your fingerprints are not in the envelope. You have never seen what they have written. We can depose before witnesses that you never saw any of this. It will be signed and sealed in a safe that you have not read it. And we will save you a lot of hassle. And that's when she thought, this is not normal for children's authors, is it? This is a new territory. This is a new area for a writer to be in. It's wonderful to be successful, but when your people have to think like that, you realize it. And sure enough, of course, dozens and dozens of lawsuits came. I gave you a story about Hermione and you used it. And she, she was, you know, they would get a letter back from a lawyer saying, in legalese, uh, off out of my face, you mad bitch. And there you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I ask the audience for an S? Ooh. Oh dear. Oh dear, sex. Well, it was the first thing that was called out. I'm, I'm the only thing that was called out. Yes, it was the only thing that was called out. Yes, was the only thing that was called out. <laughs> um, uh, not my natural area of expertise, though. So, uh, uh, um, I, I can cook a few courses in the Banquet of Love, I like to think, but um, uh, the, I don't know what that means either. Um, oh, the, God, it's going to be on record that you said uh, that. I, Probably in your obituary. I, I'm, 
I was called up in the 80s. This, this was, I, I created a, a, a strange rod for my own back um, when in the 1980s I was called up by a, a rather marvellous man who may have played, um, um, uh, played, if that's the word, who may have appeared at Hay, called Jonathan Meads. I don't, has he, has he, I'm sure he has. Um, you may remember some of his documentaries about architecture. He usually wears sunglasses and a, and a dark suit, but he's a rather wonderful writer. But at the time, he was a features editor or similar at Tatler magazine, which was, um, I think, in those days being edited by... I was either Tina Brown or it might have been Mark Boxer. And uh, he called me up. Uh, and I was not a well-known person. I'm talking about 1985 or something like that. I, I, I don't think even Blackadder would have come out yet. But I'd, I was well-known in a small circle because I was doing a little bit of journalism, a little bit of radio. I'd done some TV comedy and things like that. And, and some, you know, the writing, I suppose, mostly. And he said, I'm, I'm commissioning some people to write an article about something they don't do. Gavin Stamp is doing something about the fact that he doesn't drive... Brian Sewell is doing something about the fact that he doesn't go on holiday. Uh, somebody else is doing something about they would, they would never have a, an, a pet. Is there anything you don't do? So I thought about it. I said, gosh, I, I like to think I, I do almost everything. Well, there's sex, I suppose. I, I don't do that. Would that count? And there was a sort of pause. I said, 400 words by Thursday. Um, so I... <laughs> Uh, and it, it so happened, it fell out that, um, I've talked a bit about love, which is obviously the important thing, but um, I'd, 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 I'd had a partner at Cambridge and he and I had stayed together and in you know, the first year after leaving, we shared a, a flat together in, in London, but he was, he was much more interested in the, in the sexual gay world of London in the early 80s and I, I wasn't, I've always absolutely loathed um, gay bars and, and clubs and things, uh, just because I can't bear being looked at in that sort of inspect you sort of way, that raking eye that goes up and down. And I just feel so inadequate. And all I want to do is have a conversation. And I'm, I can't, certainly don't want to dance and I don't want to <laughs> grind away in some dark room. I just want to, you know, I, know, I just want to say, so which is your favourite Evening War novel? And uh, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> there aren't any bars for people like me, unfortunately. Um, so, so I sort of just gave up on the whole idea of sex and, um, um, and, and was happy because I was... Um, there's a, if I have a motto at the moment, anyway, it is uh, a line of Noel Cowards that somebody told me about not, not long ago, which, which he apparently said to, to, um, uh, to, to Ronnie Neem, the, the film producer and director, um, he, uh, who was saying to him, gosh, you do so much, and you get you, the plays and the songs and the this, and you never relax, you never stop. Why is it? And he said, because work is more fun than fun. <laughs> and, and that was sort of how I felt. Work was more fun than fun. If fun was sex, I got much, a much more buzz and high and a much more lasting one than, in fact, they were the opposite of each other. Um, um, you know, it was slightly difficult and hard to start off the business of work and, and it took a long time, but in the long run you felt fantastic afterwards and sex is quite, quite opposite to that. Um, and so, um, you, you know, in work, I, I just found myself not having physical congress of any kind and... That's what I was writing about. It had been about three years in the article. And I, I also said it is most peculiar that nature or uh, the divine being, which, whichever you choose, um, should, should somehow insist that the, the objects of desire, the prize the, the, uh, in, in sex, uh, the, the, the physical areas, should be contiguous and adjacent to the areas in which the expulsion of the most noxious poison is also taken care of. It's as if, it's as if nature is...